G'day everyone and welcome back to this Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar. We always appreciate your time on a Friday lunchtime and uh, we do hope you're surviving what are some extremely volatile markets at present. And if you haven't been in the markets for a long time and it will ever, and you're sitting on some capital losses and we're heading into tax time, an old trick, and this isn't tax advice, but don't be afraid to realise those tax losses, particularly if you have a capital gain, you can realise that capital loss, buy that stock back immediately. Um, you may lose a little bit on brokerage, you may lose a little bit on the spread in terms of selling stock and buying it back, but you can realise the tax loss and that can be offset against some tax gains. So an old trick from an old dog. Now, don't be afraid to ask questions of our presenters uh, who are online today. We've got some great companies, some really interesting stories. Type the questions in the Q&A box provided. Let's make a start. Uh, first up, we have Arderton, uh, ASX code ADV, market cap of around $32 million, one year return of up 20%. The company engages in the exploration of mineral properties such as gold and lithium in Australia and Canada. We have with us Rob Langley, Longley's, beg your pardon, who's both the MD and CEO. He's coming to us from Canada. We hope we have a strong internet connection. If not, we have a backup plan. Rob, over to you. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Tim. Good to get an introduction from an old dog that knows a few tricks and appreciate your time. It's uh, in the evening in Ontario where I'm calling from. Um, but it's a really good opportunity to, to give you an update on Arderton, which is focused on both its uh, Pickle Lake Gold project, uh, which we own, as well as a joint venture that we have with Green Technology Metals in the hard rock lithium space. So if we can move to our presentation. I'm not seeing the presentation come up yet, Tim. Is it live uh, in front of you guys? Yeah, Rob, we've got your uh, first slide there, our precious metal and battery mineral assets. Can you not see that? No, it's not showing here, but I, I do have it on standby just in case there was a glitch so I can talk okay. through those I'll... slides and just make sure I stay with it. Yeah. Um, so that's the precious metal and battery mineral slides asset. What we're showing there are the, the four main components of Arterton, which is a really strong cash position of over $7 million in the March quarter. We've got the Pickle Lake Gold Project, which is our core focus, where we're actually investing all of our time and, and money. Uh, and that's a massive gold project. And I'm gonna focus on that on a few slides in this presentation. We also have a 20% ownership of a project in Ontario and lithium, uh, spodumene projects. It's a joint venture with GTM who listed last November and doing amazingly well. And as part of that deal, we received 30 million shares in that company as well, separate to the joint venture and separate to the project 20% ownership. So that has a value of about $10 million as of this morning. So they're the four components that make up Arden. And what I'm gonna try and get across today is a value proposition for those that, as Tim said, there's volatility in the market. Some things are overpriced and some are underpriced. And we think that Arden arithmetically is, is really underpriced. And for those that are looking to get in on something it's going to make sense for them when the market potentially re-equilibrates and gets back to some sort of normal. Um, there's a really good situation here that, uh, that I think is fairly transparent for, for the keen investor to look at. Next slide, please. That should be a slide of uh, North ADV's Ontario assets. Um, is that right, Tim? I'll take that as yeah, a yes. Sorry, Rob, we can, uh, we can see those slides, so please proceed. Yeah, sure. So that's a, a map on the left showing uh, Ontario, which is in Canada, obviously, and all the dots and um, crosses in there are lithium and gold projects throughout. It's a real big mining exploration state, Ontario, together with Quebec and BC. It's really the the, the mining and exploration uh, hard rock part of Canada. Uh, I've got the next map will show you how many Australians are actually investing in here over the last few years. It's a really good place to invest. So we have the Pickle Lake Gold Project, which you can see in the top left there. It's a really big project that's technically sort of visible from space. It's about 122 kilometres east to west. And the greenstone belts here are east-west orientated. So you can see there, Red Lake to our west. Uh, we're in the middle there. And in the top right of us, for those that have been following the fight between BHP and uh, Twiggy for the Ring of Fire, that's just to the northwest of us as well. So some big uh, tier one deposits in our region, both in the gold and uh, base metal space. The three um, blue triangle dots there are the three joint venture lithium projects that we have with GT1, just to put you in that perspective of where we are geographically. 
So Pickle Lake, we're drilling. We're, I'm over here at the moment managing a drill program with our team, and it's a really exciting goal project that we're sitting on. You know, we're trying to get through a 7,000 metre uh, drill, drill program uh, along about a, a 10 kilometre stretch of what we call the Western Hub. In, the, in this area, we've recently seen some really big transactions. Uh, the, the Great Bear Resources Dixie Project was bought by Kinross. Um, I just mentioned that the Ring of Fire uh, transaction and all the majors are in this area. It's, it's a playing field for majors looking at what juniors are doing. And a lot of people have eyes on this district. They know that there's potentially big discoveries still to be made. And that's the absolute focus of our Pickle Lake Gold exploration. With the lithium uh, project, as I mentioned before, we've got a 20% free carry project uh, interest in that and the offtake rights. That means we don't need to contribute any money until a feasibility study is completed by GT1 and a decision to mine. Uh, GT1 recently did a massive cap raising uh, and they brought in a strategic partner. So they're really getting a lot of uh, good investment into the EV space, specialists in their area, which allows us to really focus on the gold properties, which is, which is our key, key asset. Next slide, please. This is a broader map of Canada. Just those Australian flags, there are ASX listed companies which are heavily invested into Canadian projects. And you can see it stretches all the way from Newfoundland out to the east, all the way across to BC and, and, up, and up to Alaska, which of course is the US, but you can see the spread and the reasoning behind investment into the Canadian mineral space. Next, next slide. That's a quick snapshot of our corporate structure. Um, ADV is our code. Uh, we're trading at 1.2 cents as of last night. Quite a lot of shares on issue, so it's, it's a very liquid stock. Market cap of 32 million. And that's important when I get to a couple of slides at the back end. Uh, strong cash position. And we've got some good institutions in as well that understand the gold space that really want to see us deliver some, some value into that gold space from our lithium um, value that we have with both the shares and the project ownership. Next slide, please. I won't waste too much time on some of these slides. You can read them in detail, but you can see there we've got a board with a really broad and well-experienced um, detail in joint ventures in gold in lithium, the whole gambit in there. So it's quite a big board, but each person has a particular specialization. Bruce uh, on the left there, obviously was the start of evolution. So I'm bookended on that picture by gold specialists. On the other end, Michelle Roth is based in New York. Well, she's a chairperson of a gold explorer in Quebec who have a joint venture with Agnico Eagle. So you can see that sort of experience in those contacts are really gonna help us as we go forward. Next slide, please. Um, that's just a quick snapshot. I won't, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about lithium because Luke Cox and the GT1 team can do that separately and I can refer you to them to get some really detail. This is more about the gold story, but geographically, you can see there are two maps, the one on the left and the one on the right are just Artisan's versions and GT1's version of the same thing. But you can see, for example, the orange dot that you see there, which is their Root Lake um, lithium project, that's really close to our gold project, the Pickle Lake gold project. So all these things you can throw a blanket over, they're in the same area. And we had a lot of synergies uh, with logistics, First Nation liaison, all the things that we're working on together. And it's really helping the joint venture working together. And you know, I'm meeting the guys here in, in town today, going through a lot of core storage issues, talking about First Nations, seasonal um, challenges and how we're going ahead. Next slide, please. So back to the gold space. I mentioned before evolution in the area, which, which Bruce, our chairperson, put together uh, 10 years ago or so. We've also got north of us, Newmont, actively mining the Muscle White mine. Um, that helps us. Recently, a, a road was washed out up here as the snow melts. All the roads here are open because of mining operations very quickly. So we have very few disruptions um, from those sort of events. Um, Barrack uh, uh, had a Golden Patricia Gold Mine, which is sort of within our property. So they're aware of what we're doing here. And as I mentioned before, Great Bear Resources over near Red Lake there were also uh, were snapped up by Kinross. So there was a bit of a bidding war probably for Great Bear, which doesn't even have a joint resource out yet. So that was, a, I think, a $1.6 billion transaction. And Evolution has recently moved into Pickle Lake pegging you know, Greenfield's property. They understand that this area around here has a lot of untapped potential. There's so much greenstone here which hasn't been explored properly, uh, and it's reasonably efficient and cheap to hold and to build you know, compelling size gold projects and give yourself the opportunity to find those tier one discoveries. Next slide. And the colours on that map are really just focused now in on the Pickle Lake area. The orange, green and blue areas are all out of them. And what we're trying to show there 
is the status of our permitting. It's really important to get First Nation relationships sorted here, uh, to give yourself you know, th those sort of trust values, the opportunity to drill all year round and give employment opportunities to First Nation. And based on that, the Mines Department issued three-year expiration permits. So the green and the blue areas, we're, we're pretty much fully permitted and we can drill at any time. So we have a choice of places to drill and we're making applications for the other area. It's really that area you can see there where the Barrack logo is around the, the Gold and Patricia Gold Mine, which is a historic underground mine, where we're concentrating our drilling at the moment. Uh, and we've obviously got um, joint ventures in the area with Newmont, uh, Orteco, First Mining Gold. There's a lot of activity, a lot of eyes on the Pickle Lake region. Next slide. Um, that's a really sort of, we've got 22 prospects and deposits identified on our land alone. And it's it, we're trying to prioritise that and work out where we're going to drill is, is a joy, to be honest. We've done detailed geophysics over this area, and that, that's the key to success here, is to understand the structure, understand the geology, and put the drill rig where you've got the best chance of, of making gold hits. We're currently drilling at the Esker and the Dorothy Doby um, projects, which you can see along the Western Hub. Um, and we've got a whole bunch more coming up in the pipeline. So we, we're going to have rigs moving around to different properties and making sure we hit the best possible targets. I'm over here to make sure we prioritise that drilling and, and the sampling and get some efficiency. Uh, and it's a good time of year to be here. Next slide, please. I'm going to see Tim pop up shortly. I'm watching my own time. So I'll skip through a bit of the detail on these things. I don't want to bore you with it, other than just to say you know, both Hayden and who's on standby to potentially um, jump in, who spends a lot of time in country here. We've got some really exciting structures and opportunities here with some historical gold grades, which are bonanza grades in places and some really areas which haven't been drill tested. So we understand the structure now. We've done a lot of detailed work on it and we're getting detailed analysis from Diamond Core, Orientated Core, really smart drilling, trying to work out where the structures are. There's a lot of old hits through here which were never followed up and we're trying to put it all together into a coherent story and work out where the best opportunity is to find those tier one deposits. So we're going to be drilling here for some time. There's a 100,000 ounce historical estimate along here at 5.8 grams, and we're going to be drilling that to validate some historical results so our QAQC is brought up to speed. So a lot of work going on at the moment on the Western Hub at Pippa Lake. In terms of the news flow on the next slide, please, and then we're just about done. Um, the March quarter, there's some summary there of what we've achieved so far. It's all going to be about assay results from the drilling that we're doing. Um, there'll be some news flow from what GT1 are doing uh, in the lithium space that assists us. You know, we've now got lithium and gold active at the same time. Previously, we've had either gold or lithium active at sort of opposite times, and now the whole space is really attractive. So a great opportunity to get into a company that has a foot in both camps. Uh, and so th that's the story of, of Arden. And what I wanted to try and show in the next two slides is, is an opportunity to get into the share price of 1.2 cents or whatever it may be today. Um, which is well below what we think it should be on a see-through value. So next slide, please. I've got two slides here which are identical. The first one tries to explain the makeup of the value in terms of market cap, and the other one is the same bar charts, but it shows the share price in points of a cent to make up the share price. So the first three blue bars you can see on the left there are showing in market cap, the existing cash reserves of 7 million is 7 million, obviously. The shares that we hold in GT1 are worth 10 million as a close of business last night. And 20% of the lithium joint venture based on GT1's EV, not their market cap, but their EV, is 32. Add those three together and you get what should be a market cap of 50 million. On top of that, there's the value of the free carry. There's the value of the Pickle Lake Gold Project, which makes up a number north of that. And on the far right, we said where we're sitting at today is a market cap of 32. So there's a differential there that needs to be sorted out. And I'm trying to explain that to the astute investor to see the opportunity to really get something that's undervalued now that will reset itself at a, a greater value going forward if the, if the market you know, believes in the story and understands the area. One more slide and then I'll hand back to Tim. This is exactly the same um, size of boxes for want of a better term, but instead of showing market cap, we're showing share price. So if I jump straight to the right where you see the green box, our share price is 1.2 cents. But if you add the value of the, share, the cash, the shares in GT1, the 20% uh, lithium uh, carry, the share price should be 1.9 cents without even considering the gold and the free carry. So we think there's a really good opportunity there for those that like this sort of investment, that understand the potential of these areas. And at the same time, we've got a really quality board and a lot of activity going on and results coming out in the near future. So a good opportunity, we think, 
if you want to know more, call me, call the office, call Hayden, get in touch with us, and we'll, we're really happy to explain more. This was just a quick overview. I'll jump off now, Tim, and probably hit the sack. Um, but uh, we'd be interested to hear the next two stories anyway. It's always really good to hear your sessions and take any Q&A that's, that's around on the Art of the Story quickly, Tim. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got five minutes or so for some questions here. Um, just to confirm, it's 13 million shares you own in um, GT1. I, I think in the beginning you may have actually accidentally said 30, so I'm just confirming that. Um, now, now, for shareholders, there are you know quite a few shares on issue. Is there any, any chance of consolidation? There is. Uh, that always comes up. You, you consolidate uh, shares at, at the right time. Some people like the, the liquid in there. If there's an event that happens that, that's uh, coincident with the right time to do that and our key shareholders uh, are in agreement with that, we may well do that. But there's plenty of other companies out there with billions of shares on issue that are doing really well. So it's not our biggest focus, but we are aware of it, yes. And is there any, uh, can you give us any colour on the numbers that, in terms of, you know, number of ounces being produced by some of these um, big neighbours that you have? Well, Muscle White to the north of us, uh, I think is trying to get back to about 300,000 ounces um, per year. That's just a small mine to the north. Uh, we've got Hemlo further east, which is which is a multi-million ounce producer. Red Lake itself, it, it is three mines in there. I'm not sure of Evolution's latest predictions in there. I should brush those off, but I imagine it's somewhere north of half a million ounces. Uh, New Gold have Runny River uh, just to the south of us producing. There's a lot of those sort of mines that are producing sort of 300 to 500,000 ounces. And that's really the tenor that you want to go for on a project this size. They're all underground mines. Um, there's a couple of open cut mines in sort of development stage, but most of these, I mean, I was looking at some core today alongside ours, which is from three and a half kilometers down at Red Lake. Um, so that's the potential of these deep systems. We're just scratching the surface. Um, they are big systems and, I, and I'm sure Evolution, have, I think they've doubled the resource and they're likely to increase the reserve, modernizing and getting in there and sort of joining all those projects into others. So it's it's it, it's a producing area. Um, Pickle Lake itself produced three million ounces during the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So it has been a producing area. There's nothing producing at the moment, but I'm sure you know some of the explorers in the area. There's a there is a small mine in the area. Um, if you can put some of these sort of mid tier uh, deposits together, you can really get a good production uh, profile looking ahead. And Rob, is there any plan to or opportunity to JV with some of these larger partners? Um, well, it's a case of uh, talking to everyone and making a rational de decision amongst the board about what makes sense. We think that as a junior explorer, we're not under any particular stress. As you've seen, we've got a really good, strong cash position and the ability you know, in the future to monetize some of the lithium assets. So we're, we're in control of our own destiny to a degree, but obviously we want to talk to anyone that's in the area at the right time. You know, As I said, as we, we think we're undervalued, like most miners and explorers probably do. We think there's a lot there more for shareholders at the moment to get good value from that before you know, something like that happens. Um, there, there's a lot of activity and a lot of eyes in the area. You know, we'll talk to anyone that's, that has credence. Um, and obviously our board are involved with other majors as well. So discussions are underway all, all the time, I guess. And, and people are trying to get into this area early. So we, 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 that's why we're drilling, you know, not madly, but furiously trying to get you know, the value and the results out to make sure that we, you know, we get value into the stock for shareholders. And, and just one last question, what, what sort of data points can investors and potential shareholders, new shareholders look for over the next um, six or 12 months? Sure, well, I think that the big one is, is what results we get from this drill program. Um, and I won't talk too much about that because it's obviously inside, but that's obviously why I'm here to make sure you know, we, we're absolutely prioritizing those samples and putting the drill rig in the right spot. We've got probably about an 85% ownership of, of the whole ground. We've got about another half a million dollars to spend on a joint venture, or not a joint venture, but an earning area, which we'll achieve easily in about one month of drilling on that property. And then it's absolutely 100% an Ardabin project. So that's another trigger and a nice thing to have. Those partners are at Zyra. They're good partners to have. Uh, they're assisting us along the way and have good knowledge in the area. And then the lithium space, you know, what, what happens in the lithium space? You know, that's We've, I'm not talking out of tune here, but there's a lot of lithium companies which which are really expanding fastly, and owning 20% of those projects, you know, has has an open end to what that value could be at no cost to us. So I guess they're the three things to watch: your draw results, uh, what's happening in the lithium space, and you know, 100% ownership of gold projects, you know, of size, you know, thousand square kilometers. You know, there's no typo there. I might have said 30 million shares instead of 13. 
but it is a thousand square kilometres of exploration ground that we own. Thanks, Rob. That's probably a good way to finish it. Um, enjoy your time over there. I hope you don't freeze. It's warming up. Thanks, Tim. Have to see you later. Uh, next up, we have Tech Ocean ASX code uh, T3K, market cap of around seven and a half million dollars. Company only listed in September last year. The company delivers flexible, innovative, and sustainable solutions to the oil and gas, marine, and renewable energy sectors. We have with us the general manager, Jordan Glanville. Jordan, over to you. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much, Tim. And yeah, thanks to Share Cafe for the opportunity to speak today about our interesting company. You know, our company is a bit different to what our viewers today may have seen before, so pretty excited to give a general overview. So as a quick introduction, my name is Jordan Glanville. I'm the General Manager of Renewables and Future Business at TechOcean. Um, I'm an engineer and naval architect by background, and I've been with the company for almost 11 years. So it's been quite a journey across that time. Uh, TechOcean itself, I'm um, sorry if we can jump to the next slide. Next slide again, yep, there we go. So TechOcean itself was established about 15 years ago now by a group of like-minded experts, um, and they were working in a local oil and gas industry in Bass Strait. Uh, they identified a gap in the market for a local multidisciplinary service company uh, to provide cost-effective and fit-for-purpose services, uh, mainly in Bass Strait to begin with. So from that beginning, the company's grown to provide a you know, very, very wide range of services across Australia uh, with a significantly expanded service offering. Now, my key aim for our presentation today is not so much to present what we've achieved in those 15 years, which is fairly remarkable, I think, uh, but rather to show how TechOcean are perfectly positioned as a key supplier to the energy transition. So as the world moves from you know, current oil and gas um, and fossil fuels to low carbon and renewable energy sources. So the prospects for this are really exciting for us and it's great to have the opportunity to share this with our current and future shareholders. Next slide, please. So as a quick overview of what we do at TechOcean, we offer a range of specialist services to the offshore energy industry. And we broadly categorize these into marine services uh, where we own and operate marine vessels, including the Tech Ocean Spirit, which is our pride and flagship. You can see in the first photo there. Uh, then logistics and shore-based services. So essentially the onshore supply aspects to running offshore projects. So this is everything from the port operations, loading of vessels, receipt and dispatch of equipment, um, and all those onshore management areas to make sure off offshore operations work smoothly. Then we have subsea engineering and project management services. So this refers to the planning, execution, um, and management of various projects across subsea, field development, decommissioning projects. And finally, specialist oil field services. So this is referring to our machine shop, workshop, manufacturing, and you know, general workshop services in support of oil and gas developments, um, particularly in WA. And what's key for us as a company is that we really aim to integrate these services for our clients. We like to call ourselves somewhat of a one-stop shop. So we integrate our services, uh, which really achieves reduced costs and increased efficiencies for our, our clients. And also means they only need to manage one contract rather than you know, many disparate uh, service providers. And what's also really important for us is that we, we provide our services across the full life cycle of projects. So that's everything from early stage design support, engineering support, through to construction support, uh, operation, and then into the decommissioning when, when assets come to the end of their life. Next slide, please. So we have a really proud history of delivering major projects for some of the largest clients in the offshore oil and gas industry. And now, you know, very excitingly, uh, offshore wind farm developers with Star of the South. Um, I'm sure there's some fairly familiar names uh, for our viewers on this slide, but needless to say, you. You don't work for these companies without a strong team and service offering, which we're extremely proud of. Next slide, please. So today I want to focus on our key future opportunities. We see these split between three really key areas. So firstly, we'll continue to support the operation and maintenance of existing offshore energy fields. And this is essentially business as usual for us um, with our established relationships and services. Then we have our two real key growth areas. And those are the decommissioning and rehabilitation of offshore oil and gas assets. And then of course, renewable energy. And in particular for us, offshore wind. Next slide. So firstly, I'd like to look at decommissioning and rehabilitation of oil and gas assets and what we mean by that. So an oil and gas field development is typically made up of a really wide variety of you know, really specialized equipment. 
And that starts everywhere from the reservoir, thousands of metres below the seabed, to the equipment on the seabed itself, and then the platform above the waterline and all the equipment that connects it all together. When these fields come to their end of their useful life, so they're not producing economically anymore, they need to be decommissioned safely in line with regulatory requirements. So this typically involves plugging the wells themselves, recovery of all the equipment and restoring the seabed to its previous condition. So these are really large and complex problems to overcome. What we've seen in recent years is a real significant increase in focus on the decommissioning liability by the offshore regulator. So the offshore regulator is not NOPSEMA in Australia, and that's been due to a whole wide range of factors across the country. As a result of this, several operators of oil and gas assets, they're essentially put on notice now to progress the decommissioning of their aged fields. Why this is exciting to us is that we have a really strong record in decommissioning services, particularly in Bass Strait, uh, where a lot of our operations occur. Bass Strait has some of the largest decommissioning liability in Australia, um, and we're really well placed to capture a significant portion of this. Uh, we've got a quick graph there, which indicates the market for this is estimated at 40 billion US over the next 30 years in Australia. And this covers a really wide range of services that we can provide across engineering, marine, subsea and supply based services, and even the disposal and repurposing of assets. On to the next slide, thank you. Now I thought because this is a fairly new thing potentially for different viewers, I would make this a little bit more, more tangible by talking about a recent project that we've done in this area. Uh, recently, we were tasked with managing all the subsea aspects of what is known as a plug and abandonment campaign, uh, where several subsea oil wells needed to first be plugged, so permanently plugged down hole, and then the equipment on the seabed safely recovered. Now, this field had been installed you know, decades ago with one-off custom tooling. So in order to actually decommission, decommission it and pull the equipment up, all the tooling needs to be refurbished, um, in some cases modified, upgraded to meet current standards, uh, before you can actually do that work. So we provided the expertise, the people, the equipment for all the preparation of that tooling, and then actually sent the tooling offshore with you know, quite a large range of people to work on a drill rig and complete the PA campaign or plug and abandonment campaign. What was great about this project is that it utilized almost all areas of our company-wide service offering. It was a really good success for us. So it covered you know, marine, subsea, manufacturing, um, personnel, and the final result for the client was, you know, providing a project on time, under budget, under very um, short and, you know, quite compressed timeframes uh, with reduced costs compared to larger multinational OEM equivalents. Um, there was zero non-productive time offshore, so very proud of that project, but it puts us in a really good place to move forward into these projects into the future. Jump to the next slide, please. So now moving on to offshore wind, which is you know, where we're extremely excited about the future in Australia. And my new role as GM of renewables is to spearhead this for the company. So as we all know, the world is you know, well along a path to decarbonisation of the energy sector. So in Australia, we're seeing policy targets put in place and plans moving forward to shut down large coal-fired power plants. And this is happening as soon as 2028. So you know, we're talking near-term developments. Now, for anyone who is unaware of offshore wind, and why it's rapidly becoming one of the most important components of the future energy mix, there's some really key differentiators compared to other renewable energy sources. So I've pulled out a few of these here today. Uh, the first is capacity factors. So this means the average power output of an energy source compared to its maximum output. So for offshore wind, this is up to 30% higher than onshore wind turbines and almost three times that of solar. So this is mainly due to increased regularity and speed of winds in offshore areas. I mean, of course, this is one piece of the puzzle for the future energy mix, but it's a really important one. Uh, the second point is that of scale. The maximum size of an onshore wind turbine, they push up around five to six megawatts per turbine, um, and they're constrained by what can be transported on road or installed in difficult at to access areas of high wind speed. In comparison, offshore wind turbines are pushing up to 15 or 16 megawatts. So we're talking you know, three times the size of an onshore turbine. Um, you can see my very technical comparison on this slide. You know, one of these turbines, um, which could be built, you know, for example, in Bass Strait at Star of the South, is almost as tall as Melbourne's highest building, Eureka Tower. Um, offshore wind farms are also able to be built in a much larger scale than their onshore counterparts because there's less restriction on the available space. Um, and as another example of that, Star of the South, Australia's first offshore wind farm, which is proposed off the coast of South Gippsland, 
It's expected to be able to produce up to 20% of the entire state's electricity needs from one wind farm. So the scale of these compared to onshore is very significant. Uh, the final point which shouldn't be ignored is there's you know, significantly reduced visual impact and impact on communities and really valuable land areas. So this leads to reduced land conflicts and associated costs with these. Now the global offshore wind industry is really seeing rapid growth. So I've got a graph on the screen here, which shows that there's an expected eightfold increase in offshore wind farm installed capacity by 2030, and then a staggering 60 fold increase by 2050. What is exciting for us here is that this is what we're seeing play out in Australia. So if we go to the next slide. So to put this in perspective, when we started supporting Star of the South, again, Australia's first offshore wind farm in 2019, it was the only offshore wind farm proposed in Australia, um, which you can see down in the bottom corner there. At the time, there was a lot of uncertainty around the support for offshore wind in the country, including a lack of policy and legislation to allow these wind farms to develop. Now, if we move forward to 2022 on the next slide, now there are almost 20 proposed projects across Australia. So we've seen a huge, huge increase in opportunity and you know, really big progress from a policy and legislation perspective in the country. So there's actual policy targets being set um, first in Victoria, specific to offshore wind, as well as draft legislation for the development and regulation of offshore wind projects in Australia. So what that has translated to is a huge wave of industry support, a lot of investment from overseas for, for offshore wind farms and locally, um, and this was really evident. We had the first offshore wind conference in Melbourne last month, and it was a fairly phenomenal event. Um, and the energy in the room about building a new industry in the in the Australia was really palpable. Um, and we're incredibly excited to be part of this growth. Jump to the next slide. So, how do we fit into this picture at Tech Ocean? Now, the majority of our services directly transfer to offshore wind. So marine services, vessel supply, port and supply base, engineering, project management, all of these services that we're already providing are exactly the same when we transfer them to offshore wind. We've got the local knowledge and experience to help these projects succeed in what's essentially a new frontier, and we're really excited to support them. We have a track record as well of already working on these projects, which not many companies in Australia can do. And again, if we throw back to our mission of providing an end-to-end -end service, uh, we see how this applies across the whole you know, project life cycle of these. So we're already working on the feasibility and design of these, these offshore wind farms, and we can move through to the construction operation and then you know, well and truly down the track decommissioning services. Jump to our final slide. So in finishing up today, Tech Ocean, we've been here for 15 years. We've got a strong history of providing services to the offshore industry in Australia. The addressable market for our services is set to undergo a really rapid increase over the next sort of you know, five to 10 years. And this is on the back of two really key drivers as I went through today. So that's offshore oil and gas assets, oil and gas assets reaching the end of their life, requiring decommissioning. And then finally, offshore wind projects being developed. Tech Ocean as a company, we've averaged around 20 to $30 million of revenue per year on available market, which was essentially limited to support and maintenance of existing oil and gas assets with some minor development activity. Um, and over the coming decade, this is expected to dramatically increase as the opportunities from decommissioning and offshore wind really come to execution. Um, we're really excited at Tech Ocean about this next phase, um, being part of the key, you know, a key part of the energy transition and you know, building a local homegrown service company in this area. Uh, thanks, Tim. That's all from me at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Jordan. Um, right place, right time, it appears. Um, is, is, is this a capital intensive business for tech, um, Tech Ocean? Do, do you need a lot of uh, infrastructure and equipment? Uh, on the marine side, we own and operate a vessel already. So that, that's an owned vessel that, that we have upgraded recently as well. So for vessels, they can be capital intensive, but there is definitely methods where you can lease vessels and operate them as well. And we've done that that in the past as well. On the engineering and project management, which you know, we see a lot of growth in the DCOM side, not so much, you know, you're talking about professional services. So if you have the right people, um, you know, there isn't a large capital investment requirement to, to capture those, those jobs. And we've done you know, many of them over the time of the company. And, and who, who are your key competitors in, in this space and kind of how, how do you compete for a, a contract? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question around competitors. Um, there are certainly companies that offer parts of what we do as a company. 
Uh, you know, there are other vessel operators and there's other port operators, but we have sort of carved out a fair niche of our own with an integrated service offering, which sort of pulls it all together into one contract. So, you know, we see that we've created a bit of our, our own niche in the market. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to you know, rest on our laurels. We need to be, be careful that we, we grow and maintain that, um, but we do have a key, key difference from our, our competitors. And, and you've got decent revenue. You've got a small um, market cap and you've been around 15 years or so. What, what does profitability look like? Uh, yeah, so profitability has been, yeah, consistent across the company. You know, we, we've been profitable for 14 out of our 15 years, the first year starting when the GFC hit. Um, which I don't think many companies did very well that year. But since then, we, we've managed you know, very strong um, profits each year, um, obviously impacted by COVID recently, but we've been profitable every year of our, our operations. So a very cash flow positive company. And we'll just finish on, um, so last questions. What sort of barriers do you see in terms of um, having an enabling Tech Ocean to kind of grow your contract base? Yep, no, no that's, a, that's a really good, good question. Um, I guess for these you know, very technically advanced projects, the, the first would be capability. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that we're ready with the right people and right expertise. And we have a very strong network of engineers um, and consultants throughout the company that will you know, allow us to, to be the, the best in class. Um, cost is always a, a barrier, well, not necessarily a barrier, but an opportunity for us, I think. Um, you know, we remain very cost focused and, you know, we've we maintain low overheads and we, we are very well placed to compete on cost. Um, and I guess the final one could be international competition um, you know, around all this growth in work will attract international um, you know, service companies to, to come in potentially. But what's interesting about our, our model and the way we've set ourselves as a, as a company is that we have very regularly acted as you know, force multipliers for larger companies as well, where that might not be worth them setting up a local um, operation, or it is in fact more useful for them to partner with us locally. So we've worked directly for the end client or supported larger international companies in the same way. Um, so we, we think we're fairly well placed to, to you know, expand and capture a significant portion of these opportunities. Right, Jordan, that's all we have time for. Love to follow up on the story later in the year. Um, yep. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Tim. Okay, next up, we have Torin Resources, which is uh, all the chatter in the market at the moment. Uh, ASX code TNR, market cap of $44 million. The company has emerged as a multi-commodity explorer focusing on gold, rare earths, and now critical minerals. We have with us the Managing Director, Peretz Shapiro. Peretz, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks for giving me a promotion, Tim. Uh, Executive Director now. But um, so thank you for, for, for having me today, Tim. Um, today we're going to be discussing uh, Torrens, Torrens Resources and our projects uh, in addition to a really exciting announcement that we've actually just made this morning. So if we can go to the next slide. So uh, Torrens flagship project it's the mount sterling project which sits at around 25 kilometers northwest of leonora in western australia's eastern gold fields um, great access to roads rail and infrastructure we'll move on to the next slide please um, this is a, a map of uh, of the project of the mount sterling project uh, highlighted there in yellow um, that that is our uh, that is Torrey's tenements surrounded in um, by Red 5, if you look on the right-hand side, that open pit over there, that's Red 5's flagship King of the Hills mine. Um, and then highlighted within our tenements are numerous gold targets and, um, as we'll discuss soon, rare earth and critical mineral targets as well. Next slide, please. So we'll start off with the gold, um, as this is something that the company has been known for for a number of years. And the Mount Sterling project, as you can see on the right-hand side here of the slide, sits in a very well endowed region of the gold fields. Millions of ounces uh, have been um, discovered and processed um, in the region. So the best place to look for a new gold deposit is in, in a region which has a, a significant amount of those. So to date, Torin, we have just under 120,000 uh, ounces of, uh, of gold resource, and we'll go through that um, over the next slide. So the the 120,000 ounces we intend to build on that. Um, we have a new mineral resource estimate, which is due later this month. 
um, at the, the MS Vizarian deposit and the Sterling Well deposit. That's going to come off the back of a significant amount of drilling, over 26,000 metres of drilling, which has been taking place in the last five or six months. Um, we anticipate to grow that deposit uh, of both of those deposits, both MS Vizarian and Sterling Well, uh, in addition to increasing the confidence level of that deposit from inferred and indicated to a much larger uh, portion of it being indicated. We go to the next slide, please. So as I said, numerous um, uh, uh, thousands of thousands of uh, thousands of meters of drilling over 160 odd drill holes, which will be included in the upcoming MRE. Um, and now the idea behind that MRE was to extend the strike of the resource um, and also to, to continue at depth. And we've been successful in doing that. And we've had some really significant results over the last few months. Following the resource uh, announcement, we'll be looking at a pit optimization study. And the good thing about this resource, it is mineralization from surface. So it's really suitable for a low waste, a low strip ratio, uh, open pit mining. Next slide. So this gives you a, a snapshot of the MS Vizarian, the Sterling Well resource. The MS Vizarian resource there, if you look at the Vizarian load and Mount Sterling, it moves on to Skywing. That makes up the system. That strike of that system is about 1.2 kilometers, and the initial resource last year was only done in about 740 meters. So you see there the potential for significant growth of that resource. See how it just plays off the Earth's this fault, where you'll see Tyrannus. Now, Tyrannus um, is one of our primary gold targets that sits directly on the Ursus Fault. And on the Ursus Fault itself, there are numerous other gold resources belonging to Red Five. And it's a really uh, prospective region for us to be uh, discovering potentially new resources as well as growing what we already have. Next slide, please. This gives you a long section. So it gives you an understanding of the breadth of this resource um, and the potential. Uh, to continue to grow it into the future as it remains open at depth and a long strike. Next slide. The Sterling Well resource, which sits just to the southwest of the MS Vizarian resource, currently has just over 16,000 ounces. Uh, a number of uh, about 40 drill holes approximately have been drilled since the, since the last MRE, which was done on this, uh, on this resource. Um, over 4,000 meters of drilling, we have intercepted significant gold grades outside the bounds of the original resource. So part of the global resource update coming uh, later this month will include an upgrade of the uh, Sterling Well resource as well. Next slide. So what's next uh, for, for, for our gold projects? We're going to continue to, go to, to continue to grow these resources. We've also, uh, over the last 12 months in particular, done a lot of reconnaissance work and uh, have come up with over 10 um, high priority targets, which we've ranked. Some of them have already been drilled and primary gold has been discovered. As I mentioned earlier, it's a highly prospective region with millions of ounces of gold discovered and processed. And we believe that we're sitting on a really, really significantly uh, well endowed gold, uh, gold project. So um, after the MRE, we'll be looking at a pit optimization study and followed by an additional MRE for some of our other um, gold targets, in particular the Estera gold target down in the southern part of the project. Move on to the next slide. Now I'll talk about our rare earth project, which has really grabbed a lot of attention in the last few months. This was a chance discovery which was made late in the year, late in the year last year. We identified the Yitra project. The Yitra is, is about a 1.3 kilometer uh, uh, of strike, a footprint of anomalous rare earths, which were discovered using PXRF. We followed that up, we followed that up with auger vacuum drilling. And since then, since we've discovered yttria, which uh, contains the rare earths, as well as critical minerals, which we'll talk about uh, soon, we've also discovered another prospect, Wishbone, which is about a kilometer away. And again, has about a 1.3 kilometer strike length. So a really significant footprint, um, which we are continuing to explore and just to see this, to, to, to uncover the sheer scale and size of it, um, we will be testing at this point about a seven and a seven half kilometer uh, strike corridor together. So we can move to the next slide. So what makes this rare earth discovery, or we believe makes it really unique, is within rare earths itself, there are heavy rare earths and there are light rare earths. Now, heavy rare earths are typically a lot more valuable than light rare earths. 
in our um, in our system, what we have is a system which has a significantly high ratio of hot heavy to light. So this, about 65% of the rare earths are in the more valuable heavy rare earths. We also have the five most critical rare earths that you can see on your slide. And also importantly, when it comes to processing rare earths, often it becomes quite difficult um, because the rare earths are entangled with uh, uranium or thorium and our case, we have dubbed this a clean heavy rare earth discovery because there's almost no uranium or thorium to speak of, which will make processing down the track uh, a lot cheaper and a lot more economical um, and a lot more viable. Move on to the next slide, please. So what, what have we achieved and what are we looking to achieve? So although this discovery was only made recently, we're actually well advanced. And the reason we're well advanced is there was a lot of drilling done there for gold over 2021. And since we discovered the rare earth uh, anomaly and the potential for rare earth and the rare earth that exists um, within the project, we've actually gone back to those drilling samples and are testing those and assaying them. And we're getting results fairly quickly. Um, we've in, in the middle of a mineralog mineralogy study, which um, we've announced some preliminary results today, which look really good. And we're starting to work with NAGROM on a metallurgical study, which we anticipate preliminary results during the third quarter of this year. Uh, we also anticipate having a maiden jork resource by the end of the third quarter. So we're well advanced in to, to developing this really exciting rare earths project. Um, and yeah, we're really excited for what the future holds here. We can move to the next slide, please. Now, today's in, in today's announcement this morning, we've announced that we've also uh, uncovered a, a really significant amount of cobalt and scandium. Scandium and cobalt being critical minerals and very valuable minerals as well. This, the, the unique thing about the scandium here is it's quite homogenous. It's not just in, you know, a lot in one area, it's spread throughout the system. Um, one other important part of the system, which I failed to mention earlier, is that the system is actually contained within the regolith at this stage. It's not, we haven't yet explored the, the hard rock. We anticipate it comes from the hard rock, but so far it's just in the regolith. So processing is really easy, uh, just literally digging it out of the ground, ground which we own by the way um, and it's it, it will be it, it's something which we're really excited about in particular with the addition of the announced scandium and cobalt today next slide please so we have a, we have a we at Torian um, we've got a number of commodities that we're exploring really excited about our gold project and our rare earths and critical minerals um, we're continuing to work in the right location and we look to continue to grow and develop these exciting assets. Next slide. Yep. Um, there's a, a just a corporate snapshot of where we're at at the moment. If we move towards the end of the presentation. Next slide. Again, you could read that for yourself. We've got a great mix of youth, experience, technical, corporate, and uh, legal expertise. And next slide, please. And that concludes the presentation. So thank you very much for, for your attention today. Thanks, Peretz. Uh, we've, got, we've got a number of questions here. I mean, Torin, and I believe you're about to rebrand as well. Um, you, you, you're kind of spoilt for choice here. Can you, can you talk about how you manage gold production with rare earth production with potentially critical earth production? Right. So the critical minerals and the rare earths are mixed together within the one um, within the one project. Um, so that's that's the one. With the gold, um, we've spent a lot of time over the last year or so um, developing our gold assets. We will continue to develop our gold assets. You know, we've done a really good job at retention of our technical team and our fieldies over the last 12 to 18 months. And credit goes to our exploration manager for that. So it's been difficult to get uh, to get people over that time. We've been able to keep our people, which makes things a lot easier when we're talking about developing our projects on the ground. Um, at this stage, we are a very binary focused company. We're not just rare earths, we're not just critical minerals, we're not just gold. Um, we focus on all of it. And the good thing is it's not in different locations either. It's all on the same piece of land and the same project. And 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 does the company, and the company's kind of diverted in different directions in the past, mm -hmm. does the company have the expertise to manage these, these different, um, different areas of mining? Yeah, so the reason why we found um, this rare earth, uh, pro, well, we found this rare earth deposit, or well, not deposit yet, but um, hopefully soon to be, 
is because Claudia, our exploration manager, actually used to work at Northern Minerals when they made their rare earth discovery. Um, so he has been out, uh, he's got wealth of experience in gold and now rare earths uh, and rare earths as well. And he's able to focus on both of those. We've also recently announced that we'll be bringing on a new technical director, Mr. Matthew Longworth, will be joining us um, at the, after our AGM, AGM next week. Um, he's got a wealth of experience in gold and Scandium as well. There was, there was a heading in uh, headline in um, Reuters today talking about how the Pentagon has asked Congress to fund mining projects in Australia and the UK. And um, last year, I think it was, the Pentagon actually allocated uh, $30 million to Linus, which is out um, not far away from where you are. Yeah. And, and they're obviously a $7 billion company. But to get to that next stage, particularly with um, critical minerals and rare earths, there is a lot of government and uh, support and, and potentially funding, um, but that's a long pathway for, for Torin. So how do you kind of manage these different areas in that regard? Right, so we are actively working um, at the moment to secure government funding, both state and federal. Um, whilst we are not quite there yet for significant funding, um, we believe that following the preliminary results of our metallurgical testing, which at this stage, everything looks good, we haven't encountered any negatives just yet. So fingers crossed it does come out well. Um, we, we, don't be, we believe that we will be a significant target for that type of investment because of the really unique nature of what we have. It's clean, it's got all the critical minerals, it's got the scandium, the cobalt, and um, it's all in the regular. It's much easier processing. And, and, and from a processing perspective, mm -hmm. not having radioactive materials like uranium and, and I forget the other one, thorium, is it? Thorium, thorium, yeah. yeah. It must, must be a clear advantage in terms of kind of ESG principles as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it makes your processing easier, cheaper. You know, your environmental issues are, 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 much, are much reduced. I mean, typically rarer for finding and processing is quite dirty, um, but without the uranium and the thorium, it makes it much cleaner. Um, so that's, you know, a unique edge that our rare earth project has. And, and I would have thought for potential off takes into your, your rare earths and critical elements, uh, critical minerals, sure. that's a, a very important consideration moving forward. Sure. We, we've already commenced discussions with off take brokers who are keenly following our progress. Um, and there's no shortage of partners, whether it's the local Australian government or governments in, in Asia like South Korea, Japan, or even the United States. I mean, there's no shortage of demand for these type of uh, for this type of mineral. Great, Perez. Uh, that's all we have time for. The story is really developing rapidly. Thank you. Um, just to just to go time. back, sorry, Tim. What you mentioned earlier, we are changing our name, so people should should be aware um, on Monday to Azra Resort, uh, Azra Minerals. And the reason is Torian has been known as a gold company for many many years. And as we go through this transformation of having this binary focus with gold, rare earths, and critical minerals. Um, we believe it's perfect timing to, um, to rebrand um, so that uh, people don't think of us as just a gold business. And, and what's the new code? It will be ASR. ASR. Okay, we'll follow yeah. that. Thanks, Perez. Thank That's you. all we have time for. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, Tim. Next up, uh, we have Nickel X. Uh, plenty of chatter on this company as well. ASX code NKL, market cap of $10 million. Uh, it hasn't been around for 12 months. The company is an exploration company that has secured a strategic foothold in the prolific Albany Fraser Belt in Western Australia. We have with us the Managing Director, Matt Gauci. Matt, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Good to be with you. And uh, thank you to um, Share Cafe for uh, getting uh, Nicolex into, uh, into the system. So, yeah, it's a really exciting story. We've recently acquired uh, the Cosmos South uh, Nickel uh, project in the world-class Walloona Greenstone Belt. So uh, the company's gearing up for a joint program on that. Um, clearly, we have, uh, we're have we in the shadow of giants with IGO to the north and um, BHP to the south. Um, we've got a strategic land holding, so it'll be a pretty exciting time ahead. Just to the next slide. Uh, next one. Yep. So we're obviously guided by a highly experienced nickel exploration team through um, myself, Jonathan Downs, who's obviously well-known um, mining executive throughout uh, throughout Australia. So Cosmos South is 10 k's south of the world-class nickel operations of uh, uh, Cosmos, now owned by IGO, um, and 20 kilometres north of Leinster operations, operated by BHP Nickel West. Um, it's a prolific nickel producing belt, 
um, and we've got a strategic land holding uh, right in between those two projects. So the initial work that we've done is identified ultramafic rocks that extend from both those projects run through Cosmos South. Obviously, ultramafic rocks have got uh, have got the uh, opportunity to, to host cromartiite and nickel sulfide deposits. Uh, we've progressed the exploration and um, prioritisation of targets um, to identify the CS1 target. Um, it's been defined by prospectivity and geological data modelling, um, close space mag surveys, which we just completed only a couple of weeks ago, and that um, lit up a huge mag anomaly. Um, and then reprocessing of electromagnetic surveys, um, which again have highlighted really strong conductors that uh, overlay those mag uh, anomalies, which is exactly what you want when you're looking for a, a large nickel sulfide deposit. So the large bedrock conductor has got a strike of about 565 metres to a depth ex extent of about 800. So it's a reasonable size, but importantly, um, the conductance um, is up to 12,000 siemens of the, uh, of the uh, moving loop EM survey. So um, it's really lighting up and, and clearly it's just waiting to be drilled. There's been no real systematic drilling done on the project previously, um, and we're fortunate enough to be awarded a co-funded drilling grant by the West Australian government, um, up to 180 grand. Um, and together with our cash, we're obviously pretty well funded to uh, execute a program. So next one. Pretty straightforward capital structure. We've got 70 odd million shares on issue. Uh, market cap fully diluted, about 13. Enterprise value of, of, uh, of about 10 million. Um, and enough cash in the bank to execute this drilling program. Really good leadership team. Jonathan Downs, as I said, has got 25 years experience in the industry. Um, formerly worked at uh, Anaconda Nickel as their business development manager. Um, I've listed a number, number of companies in the Albany Fraser Belt, uh, particularly. Um, and clearly really excited about Nickel X's future. Uh, Technical Director Ozzy Cruiser and Exploration Director Chris Butera, both PhD geologists who have got uh, significant experience in gold and base metals through WA. Um, and our Exploration Manager, Tony Donner, he's a recognised global expert uh, in nickel exploration. So it's a fantastic leadership team. Next one, thanks. So this is just a snapshot of, uh, of Cosmos South. As you can see, we're pretty much smack bang in the middle of uh, the Leinster uh, or the Walloona Greenstone Belt um, with Leinster only 20 k's to the south, Cosmos to the north. Um, we've already identified some fantastic targets within our project. Um, wasn't too long ago that we, we remember Cosmos was taken over by Extrata to the tune of, uh, of about 3.1 billion at the time upon their discovery of Cosmos. And then as we know, um, right at the moment, IGO are completing their takeover of Western areas. Um, who, who own Cosmos um, to the tune of about 1.3 for this and, and the Forestonia group. So a lot of corporate activity in the belt. Um, and we're one of the only few, if only, um, independent junior explorers uh, in the belt. So we, we think we're really well positioned. Yep, next one. So all of the uh, mag data that we reprocess, first vertical derivative, uh, second vertical deriv derivative highlighted, um, interpreted ultramafic rocks, um, which run again, as I said, from uh, from Cosmos all the way through to Leinster. Um, so that's the first port of call, just to see if you've got the right uh, potential ultramafic rocks, and that's all been done. Um, as I said, we flew our own uh, drone survey, a very close space survey um, over this area, only yeah, with results for only a couple of weeks ago, which um, all the guys and girls can see on our ASX announcement, and that just absolutely lit up that uh, mag anomaly, which is uh, which has got everybody pretty excited. Uh, next one, thanks. So as we know, you need really good, um, strong electromagnetic um, responses to identify bedrock conductors, which clearly are the source of any potential massive sulfides or uh, nickel sulfide uh, deposits in the area. Um, and these were very, very strong uh, responses with the EM surveys. Um, that coupled clearly with our uh, MAG surveys has given us some very, very clear targets. Um, on the left-hand slide, uh, the bottom, you can see that's the model conductor, which goes from basically near surface, surface um, 50 odd metres all the way down to sort of 800 metres and 
um, and it's uh, about 500 metres in width. So um, we've got a pretty large system to have a crack at here. Um, so that's the next start, ne next um, phase after doing your mag surveys, having put both those together, um, has given us a really, really good level of confidence that we're onto something here. Um, next one. So as you can see on the right hand side, that's the uh, compilation of the um, moving loop, uh, fixed loop EM uh, work done uh, in conjunction with the MAG, um, underlying MAG surveys which we recently did. And because they're obviously coincident with that large um, MAG anomaly, um, and given the EM anomaly is a, a very high strength, um, as I said, up to 12,000 Siemens, then um, that's allowed us to identify some pretty high priority drill targets. Uh, on the left uh, hand side of that slide is our planned uh, or proposed drilling program. Uh, that was a part of the um, EIS application that we put into the West Australian government and was successful in getting a grant for that. Um, and again, we're looking at uh, going a little bit deeper than uh, what previous drilling was done. So on the, the green holes, obviously, or the green um, start of the holes, um, are the ones that were planned, the ones that are the blue start of the holes were the ones that were previously previously done and they were very shallow and there was only two of them. So we're pretty keen to do a systematic drilling program given the targets we've generated here. Next slide, thanks. Yeah, so not to be a one trick pony, Nicolex has got some pretty serious intellectual property within our group um, that builds prospectivity models. Um, what these effectively are is putting all your geochemical, geological, geophysical data um, into a black box, if you like, and then coming out with areas of interest um, that are ranked from you know, blue, as we can see on the bottom right, um, being low prospectivity to red, being very high prospectivity. Uh, and when looking to generate projects or deal with other companies, it really just reduces the amount of area that um, you want to be focusing on. So it's pretty advanced. Um, Pretty advanced work programs. It's all our in-house IP. Um, we've completed that on the South East Yulgarn or the Eastern Goldfields, and just just about to start doing one on the Southwest Yulgarn. So that gives you an extra tool to generate further projects and/or uh, acquisitions or joint ventures. So we're really comfortable with the way that's been done. Next slide, thanks. So that's the process you go through. Just your conceptual or genesis model, um, acquire all the spatial data, as I said, your geochem, um, geological, geophysical, apply uh, your fuzzy fuzzy knowledge, which is uh, effectively just knowledge that um, all of our technical team have uh, working in the area. Um, and then you rank them from zero to one in terms of um, the potential of hosting a, a nickel sulfide deposit. Um, and then we come up with a, a model that um, drives our our uh, business development programs and project generation programs. Next slide, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so pretty straightforward story, guys. Not uh, not too complex. We've uh, obviously got a nickel company um, that's purely focused on nickel sulphide in Western Australia. Uh, we're building nickel sulphide assets, uh, commenced with obviously the Cosmos South project um, in a truly world-class nickel district, strategic land holding in between two giants of the of the industry. Um, we've done all the preparatory work in terms of defining our drill targets. Um, the drilling is all fully funded with a grant from the West Australian government, um, as well as our existing cash position. Um, so we think we're in a really good position and really excited to, to move the program forward. Um, that will go through um, the standard permitting process, um, which is obviously standard heritage agreements, heritage survey, um, put the POW in, um, which will be on the back of the the drilling grant that we, we received from the West Australian government and uh, securing a rig. Um, we've got a really good relationship with DDH1, who some of the guys with big shareholders of Nicolax as well, which helps. Um, and so, yeah, once we're done and dusted with all that process over the next couple of months, we're, we're really excited to get on the ground and, and have a crack at uh, Cosmos South. Thanks, Matt. Um, got a, quite a few questions here for you. There's actually been a lot of positive press about mining lately. There was a, a headline about, you know, the um, energy transition, uh, clean energy transition being all about mining. What, what, what's it like out there in terms of, um, for your business, in terms of securing equipment and drillers and people? How, how busy is it out there? 
Oh, look, it's it's unbelievably busy. I, I haven't seen it as busy as this for uh, for a number of years, probably back in 2010, 2011, no, 2008. Um, um, so, yeah, it's not, the labs, I think, are the ones that have got a fairly big uh, backlog. Um, jewellers aren't too bad um, from what our discussions are with the jewellers. There are rigs available, uh, but it's actually more getting the human capital um, to, to run them and the right human capital to run them. Um, COVID hasn't helped um, some of the drillers because uh, they'll usually get some of their um, drillers off siders um, from over east. Um, so, yeah, but I think you've just got to have the right relationships, be in the right place and um, effectively uh, have the right projects, which some of the guys can, can quite often uh, participate in. Um, so, yeah, that was the ABC program, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, watch that. Of, yeah. yeah it was very positive. And, and how closely are your neighbours um, following what you're doing at Cosmos? Yeah, I clearly can't go into too much. Um, uh, but, yeah, there's been discussions had with, with, with all of our um, neighbours, all the, both of the two neighbours in the district. We know the guys really well as well. Some of them worked with them before. Um, and there's, yeah, always going to be interest. As we know, BHP or Nickel West are downstream players as well. So they're not only miners, they'll... Um, they'll produce downstream. Uh, we know uh, IGO have partnered with um, one of Andrew Forrest's companies, who's a major shareholder of IGO, to announce they're going to be doing the same thing as well. Um, so uh, that gives it an additional opportunity, I guess, if you are going to be producing, or well, first of all, discovering and then producing nickel in the district, then um, you know, you'll be able to deliver to a, to a player you know, nearby, as opposed to having to ship anything offshore. And, and given your pro prospects, are you looking to extend your kind of exploration licences to kind of adjacent areas? Uh, pretty, pretty difficult too, to be honest with you, because it's all, all locked up. Um, yeah. There are discussions going on with a, a number of other uh, smaller uh, unlisted prospectors. Um, so there is the potential of doing that. But as I said, with our prospectivity model through uh, the southeast Yilgarn and the eastern gold fields, then we're, we're looking at other targets through that part of the world, in which discussions are ongoing. Um, and as we build up our southwest Yilgarn prospectivity model, the, the same thing will happen um, in that part of the world. And, and can you give us a little bit more colour on, on the board and management and kind of your, your previous experiences and, and, and networks? Yeah, look, Jonathan Downs is... Um, is, is a really well-known mining executive throughout um, throughout Australia. Um, it's currently, um, well, previously was business development manager at uh, Anaconda Nickel, which is obviously was a, was and, and still is a, a pretty big producer of nickel. Um, he's got a, a fantastic um, concept of what is and what isn't um, market attractive from a from a nickel exploration and development perspective. Um, and then, yeah, Ollie Cruz is a PhD in gold, um, but it's had, and I worked with Ollie sort of 10 years ago on doing a nickel prospectivity model across Western Australia for a private equity group. So we've still got all that sort of um, knowledge. Uh, and then Chris Butera, again, another PhD geologist in gold, um, has uh, also worked in base metals through, through Western Australia. And yeah, Tony Donaghy is obviously leading our exploration. He's a global expert in nickel having worked through um, all of West Australia on just about every nickel um, sulphide project and, and also in Canada um, through a lot of the nickel uh, projects over there. So it, it's a huge IP um, from a board and management perspective. Um, and now we're sort of pretty confident just to stick on Cosmos South. Um, the, the reward could be enormous. And we know, you know, when uh, Kerry Harmanis had, um, had Jubilee, um, discovery and then take over at 3.1 billion. Um, the, the options on the table are do you go out and continue to, to acquire projects or do you just wait until you drill this one? Because there's no point in my belief, and I think the board are on the same page, to go and buy other projects until you've actually given this one a good crack. So that's a pretty simple story, to be honest. Um, right, Matt, that's all we have time for. Really appreciate the story. Um, we'll follow it with interest. And I know the market's following it with interest as well, given all the chatter. So good luck out there. Yeah, good one, Tim. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, any other questions, then feel free to jump on the website and or, or give us a call. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. That's all we have time for. Enjoy your weekend. We'll be back again next week.